Emerging Conservation Professionals Network. Joining me is Aisha Fuentes, ECPN Communications Officer, and Aisha and I are very pleased to moderate today's program, Beyond the Prerequisites, Preparing for Graduate Education in Art Conservation, the fifth webinar in a series presented by ECPN. We are thrilled to have with us a fantastic panel of conservation educators representing the five North American graduate programs in art conservation. Before we continue, I want to familiarize you a little bit with the GoToWebinar program that we're using today to facilitate the webinar. In the view window, where you see the title slide, it can be resized by clicking and dragging from the lower right corner. The control panel is where you can see, as an attendee, your own screen, and you can take a little bit of control. You may find that within activity, the control panel automatically minimizes. And if you wish to turn off this feature, you can go to the View menu and deselect the Auto Hide option. And the audio section of your screen just indicates whether or not you are connected with us by phone or by internet. And all of you listening are currently muted, so the way that you can communicate with us and each other is through the question and chat box at the bottom right of your screen. There is also a raise hand option, but we won't be using that today. During today's program, our speakers will address a range of issues surrounding pre-program preparation that you will not find among the coursework requirements and internship prerequisites listed on the university's websites. I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment, but first I'd like to share with you some more information about ECPN and highlight some of our past webinars. For those of you who are not familiar with ECPN, we are a network within AIC dedicated to supporting conservation professionals as they move through the first stages of their careers. We do this by organizing a variety of initiatives and programs, which includes AIC's mentoring program, contributing to the PR toolkit that's hosted on AIC's wiki, a regional and graduate liaison program, which helps us connect with emerging conservators across the United States, a webinar series, and programming at the AIC annual meeting, which has included informational meetings, portfolio sessions and seminars, happy hours, posters, and most recently, a very successful networking session. To learn more about ECPN, we encourage you to join us for our monthly conference calls, which are usually held on the second Tuesday of each month at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And please subscribe to our periodic e-blasts, which you can do by logging onto the AIC website and editing your profile by selecting ECPN under your interests. And as I'm sure many of you are already well aware, you can also follow us on our Facebook page and by following the AIC blog, Conservators Converse. Visit the link on the screen for more information. Through our webinar series, ECPN strives to connect with all levels of our membership, pre-program individuals, graduate students, and recent graduates, by addressing a range of topics of interest to emerging conservators and responding to the needs of emerging professionals at the different stages of their career. Since 2012, we have hosted webinars on the topics of self-advocacy and funding, private practice, pre-program internships, and outreach and advocacy. Recordings of all of our webinars may be accessed on AIC's YouTube channel, and a recording of today's program will join those recordings shortly after the program. Okay, now to return to today's program. We are very pleased to welcome what we consider an all-star panel of conservation educators, and we are so glad that they are able to take the time to speak with us today. Our speakers include Peggy Ellis from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, James Ham from Buffalo State College, Rosaline Hill from Queens University, Debbie Hess Norris from the Winterthur University of Delaware program, and Ellen Pearlstein from the UCLA Getty program. Biographies for each of our speakers can be found on a blog post published by ECPN on the AIC blog earlier this week. Today, our panel of speakers will respond to three topics developed by ECPN about preparing for graduate education in art conservation. In the interest of time, we've asked each of the speakers to take the lead on one topic. However, you should know that our speakers have been working collaboratively to address these topics and provide a response that reflects the perspectives of all five programs. Throughout the webinar, you will see images of students from each of the five training programs represented in the slideshow. And our program will conclude with a question and answer session moderated by Aisha. These questions were selected from those submitted by you, the audience, through the webinar registration form, Facebook, and our post to the AIC blog. And as we received more questions than will be possible to address in the Q&A session, we've arranged for an extended Q&A immediately following the main program. So we hope that many of you will be able to stick around for that. Okay, and as I've already mentioned, today's program will not focus on prerequisites for admission to the graduate programs. For more information on the pre-program pre internship hours and coursework requirements, GRE scores, and portfolios, 
we encourage you to visit and become familiar with each of the department websites listed on this slide, as the requirements do vary from program to program. And don't worry if you aren't able to jot down these addresses just now. This slide will reappear at the end of the program during the Q&A session. So now we're going to go ahead and start the program. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful panel of speakers, and let's begin the discussion with our first topic. Rosaline Hill of Queens University and Debbie Hess Norris will take the lead on this one. So Rosaline and Debbie, the first question is, what experiences and qualities beyond the prerequisites do the admissions committees look for in an applicant? In other words, what qualities do you look for in an applicant beyond the three-legged stool of art studio, connoisseurship, and science skills? Rosaline, why don't you begin? Great, thank you. So as Queens is a two-year program, students apply directly to the stream that they want to major in. So for instance, students apply directly either to paper, paintings, objects, or the research science stream. Because of the requirement to apply directly to a major, we look for students who have a knowledge about and experience with their declared major. So how does a student demonstrate that? Well, we look for students who can clearly articulate why they want to study art conservation and why they've selected their major. So how can they demonstrate that? Well, they can demonstrate that by expressing how they've been involved in the field of cultural heritage, how they seeked out opportunities for volunteers, opportunities, or work-study opportunities in museums, libraries, with um, conservation applications, preservation applications, um, digital preservation. Have they been able to work with First Nations groups um, to deal with preservation issues uh, relating to First Nations or other cultural groups? We look also towards experience that may not have been directly related to conservation treatment or conservation in its um, uh, treatment museum aspect but also we look for students that have been able to look at conservation in a broader context. Have they been able to look at opportunities in their region, in their uh, geographic area, to be able to demonstrate an understanding and knowledge um, and ability to access um, opportunities? Um, we look for students who have had conservation lab experience. On our website, you'll notice that we don't require conservation lab experience. It's highly desirable, but not a requirement. That said, our program is highly competitive, so if you're able to have conservation lab experience, that is extremely um, beneficial. Um, we're looking for students that have a broader awareness of the field of conservation. So are they aware of or members of the American Institute for Conservation, the Canadian Association for Conservation, and or local groups such as the Pacific Conservation Group in Vancouver and Victoria, or say the uh, Washington Guild in D.C.? We're looking for students who are aware of or take part in various listservs, like the Conservation Dist List, that they're aware of the various Facebook pages associated with each one of the programs. All of this leads to um, a demonstration and a confidence in the student's selection in their proposed major for their application at Queen's. We are looking also for students who have exhibited um, experience in looking out and visiting conservation labs, both public and private, in their regions and beyond. We're looking for students that have a recognized understanding that science, chemistry, and organic chemistry is important for all aspects of conservation. We're looking for students 
that have hands-on experience. So at Queen's, hands-on experience can be looked at in two ways, hands-on in a conservation lab, but if you haven't had the opportunity to have experience in a lab, it's also hands-on in terms of studio art, whether that's fine art on paper, whether that's furniture making, or whether that's something to to do with some other aspect of art. That's equally important. <clears throat> We're looking also for critical thinking. Are you able to sort of assess articles, what is involved in conservation, your abilities, which speaks to self-awareness? Self-awareness being what are your skills that you bring to the program? What do you think you need? Also, the ability to think holistically. Art conservation is a broad field. We draw on many, many different disciplines to allow us to preserve cultural materials to the best opportunity possible. So we're looking for students that have a very wide or are willing to think very broadly in terms of how to problem solve. We're also looking for students that have examples or an opportunity to demonstrate that they've been able to work effectively in a team. So I guess that speaks to um, the ability to work well with others, good humor, and all the rest. Um, we're also looking for students that demonstrate curiosity, that have energy, the ability to focus, and an attention to detail because conservation is nothing if not the ability to focus, to look holistically, the attention to detail, and the ability to actually complete a project to an extremely high level. On a very uh, basic level, Queen's has um, an, a requirement of a B-plus average, a 3.3 grade point minimum. Um, we look actively for people who meet that very basic minimum. It's a very competitive program to get into, as are all the programs. So anything that you can do to enhance your application would be worthwhile. We actively um, encourage students to contact Queens ahead of time, so ahead of their application date, so that we can talk with them in terms of being able to enhance their application. Debbie, do you want to take over? Debbie, are you there? I can go okay. on. Okay, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, you guys. <laughs> Good. Um, so thank you, Rosaline, and um, thank you, ECPN, for organizing this yes. webinar and for your hard work, not just in doing this, but all the initiatives and activities that Michelle spoke about really has made a tremendous difference in uh, the lives, I think, of emerging conservators, and, and we're most grateful for that. Rosaline made so many excellent points, and uh, some of my commentary will repeat what she had to say, but um, hopefully we'll elaborate a bit in areas of interest. So what are we looking at beyond the requirements? Certainly a sincere interest in the field at large and the challenges that we face in the preservation of cultural heritage, and ideally a commitment to global reach where that's practical. It's not that we anticipate that all of our applicants will have opportunities to work around the world, but we certainly anticipate that there may be an interest in addressing some of these challenges that we're all grappling with. We're looking for manual skills and dexterity, good humor and empathy for others, the ability to focus, teamwork and collaboration, which is increasingly important in our field uh, across the board, whether you're working in Africa, the Middle East, the United States, Latin America, and we're looking for evidence of that in an applicant's activities. Critical thinking and, of course, the ability to connect academic coursework 
to hands-on experiences is, is so critical. Can an applicant take something that they might have learned in an art history, a studio course, or a chemistry course, and apply it in a direct way to a project they're involved in, whether it's preventive conservation, conservation treatment, documentation, etc. We're looking for patience, problem solving, independent thinking. The application, as I've said earlier, really to scientific and art historical knowledge to their work in a conservation environment or perhaps in other activities that they've been involved in. An understanding of ethics, the philosophies, the general knowledge of the field that one would gain through work in conservation studios as well as through membership in AIC or the Canadian Conservation Group, as Rosaline mentioned. Curiosity is key and a willingness to delve deeper and to show initiative, to demonstrate that you have taken a project um, and done additional reading in art history or in, or in science or in conservation related topics is really important. The ability to think deeply, to make connections between those legs of the stool. We always talk about conservation as a three-legged stool. We always talk about building those legs and enhancing your scientific, your art historical, and your hand skills as you build the skill through your career, as you build the stool, sorry, through your career. But we're also looking for your ability to integrate the information between those legs, between those rungs, and um, the understanding that emerges in doing so. We're looking for energy, of course, and passion, a commitment to the preservation of cultural heritage, to art and culture, and um, the interest in expanding your pre-program experience in other ways. For example, have you had the opportunity or pursued opportunities to engage with public audiences, to blog, to lead tours, to share your knowledge and social media, whatever that might be. And there's so many ways to do so. It's, it's an exciting time, really, to be involved in the field. So what are some strategies that might help you to address these and other characteristics that we're all seeking? Rosaline has mentioned them. I'll, I'll go through my list as well. Um, Certainly, take time to carefully review the prerequisite requirements for all of our programs. They're similar in some ways, and they're different in others. So be sure that you are well aware of application deadlines, of requirements, um, pursue multiple applications, ensure that your GREs are strong, and never, ever hesitate to ask questions of current students, of alums, and certainly of the programs themselves. We're all here to help, to promote the field, to guide you, to provide you with direction. Um, and so don't ever be shy. Be your own advocate. Pursue advanced coursework in one or many areas to further distinguish your candidacy. So whereas we all have requirements in studio art and art history, anthropology, uh, museum studies, and or science, uh, pursue opportunities beyond those requirements. Work beyond those prerequisites. Consider a course in instrumental analysis or biochemistry. And if, as an undergraduate, if you're still an undergraduate, engage in research if possible. It could be an art historical project. It could be a, a project in uh, chemistry or other areas as well. And also think about if you're interested in working in the global stage, an area studies minor or a language minor or major as well. Take short courses, attend seminars and workshops regionally on conservation and related themes. Think about business themes, fundraising, nonprofit management, communication skills. And document these in your resume. List lectures and other things that you've attended. This is not something you can do later on in life. I'm sure that uh, our resumes, we couldn't possibly list uh, it wouldn't be smart for us to list lectures we've attended, but at your point, in your stage of your career, this is a welcome addition to your resume. What have you done to bolster your knowledge? Take weekend studio courses to strengthen your craft and hand skills, glass blowing, jewelry making, spinning, weaving, gilding, woodworking, etc. Um, we need you to work to demonstrate your natural hand skills and your abilities beyond, again, the studio requirements. Go to regional lectures, visit programs during open house events if possible, ask lots of questions. Again, don't hesitate to contact us for advice. Secure pre-program experience, and in doing so, ensure that these offer an opportunity for the demonstration of hand skills, problem solving, curiosity, a supervisor who explains why choices are being made ideally. You can focus on examination, on treatment, preventive, service work. Um, all of this is important toward engaging in the field.
Develop a bibliography of literature related to key projects that will broaden your perspective and understanding of current thinking and challenges. And of course, read the literature constantly. Follow arts advocacy organizations engage locally and regionally where possible with their work. Do what you can in your community to promote art and culture and the preservation of cultural heritage. As Rosaline mentioned, join guilds and volunteer to serve on committees. Visit conservators in their labs and studios and network and stay connected with those who are helping you because they want to continue to do so. So build your own core group of mentors and keep them advised and updated on what you're doing and what you're seeking. Rosaline mentioned to join, of course, AIC and CAC and ECPM. Um, I need to watch out for my time, so let me hey, just... Debbie, wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost, I'm almost done. All right, great. So, um, but one thing on the global stage is think about joining IIC, ICOMCC, and follow the ECROM web, the newsletter online. So there's lots of really great inter, um, introductory information there that could help you. So finally, engage with public audiences, volunteer on weekends for local tours, again, doing blogs, doing stuff on Facebook and social media. All of these initiatives and activities, I think, will prepare you well. I know will prepare you well, and we certainly um, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Debbie and Rosaline. That's really great information for our audience and wonderful advice, uh, which I'm sure will connect with our, our subsequent discussion topics. So moving right along to our second topic, we have Ellen Perlstein of UCLA and James Hamm of Buffalo State, who will lead the next topic. Ellen and James, what do you Thank feel you. is the most important for pre-program individuals to be aware of with regard to the field before embarking upon graduate level training? Ellen, why don't you take the lead? Thank you very much, Michelle. Thanks again to ECPN for all this wonderful work. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this. Um, so, you know, I think Rosaline and Debbie have actually given you um, a lot of the means um, that you would utilize to become aware of the field um, as a pre-program individual and to give you a, this sort of um, awareness, broader awareness, um, before you embark on graduate level training, and I think that actually, um, in in speaking with all of the, all of our panelists, the overall answer to this question um, really did uh, come down to um, this this kind of awareness, this sort of thorough and realistic acquaintance with the profession of conservation, and also what are the future career opportunities. And you gain that through the, your experience, um, your, you know, your internships, your volunteer work, your attendance at lectures, your networking, your professional service, or courses that you've taken, all of which my, my colleagues have pointed out. Um, one of the things that I think is important to say kind of about the field that you would want to be aware of is that conservation has become increasingly more holistic. Um, that if you are working um, in a, in a pre-program internship in a laboratory or institute and you are sort of um, witnessing the fact that, that, that your supervisors are very involved in policy making and enforcing procedures or exploring the environment, if they're doing all of these different things that seem not to be directly focusing on individual items or individual treatments, that you should value the opportunity to learn about these more kind of holistic issues. And you can do that by requesting to sit in on meetings where um, these kinds of uh, uh, processes are being discussed, or you can you can assist to do um, assist in doing what would be considered um, kind of overall collections maintenance and um, maybe uh, pest management uh, steps, etc. So these are all really great opportunities in pre-program work that reinforce this holistic emphasis. Um, the other thing that I can say about the field that I think it's important for pre-program individuals to be aware of is that the field of conservation 
is, is now more than ever encompassing much more knowledge from other disciplines than it ever did in the past. So you've heard um, Rosaline and Debbie talk about um, taking classes in you know, glass blowing or an analytical instrumentation or I mean in my case it would be bird biology you know because um, of my particular area of interest but but I think it's true that students um, preparing to embark on a conservation graduate study should expect to be introduced to a really broad range of topics enabling you to specialize later on, to build on this foundation to specialize later on, so that it's important to be open to lots of different future paths, um, all of which are uh, fall under the rubric of conservation. Um, there are collections managers, conservation scientists, preventive conservators, documentation specialists, just to cite a few examples. And so pre-program experiences that um, expose you to any of those are very important. Um, Debbie has also pointed out how conservation is increasingly a global field and I too had on my notes here that um, students should uh, su subscribe to the conservation distribution list, should visit program websites, to look at what's going on globally, should look at sites such as the Getty Conservation Institute and the um, website for ECROM which is ICCROM, the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. And that will increase your awareness of global considerations. And then in my um, final few minutes before I turn this over to James, I was going to shift to actually um, expectations students should have about what their postgraduate experience, experiences will be. And these are kind of pragmatic. Um, it's typical for young conservators to follow their education with fellowships that can be one or two years in duration at different museums or institutes and they necessitate often a location change for the student, for the, the postgraduate. So um, it's helpful to be sort of aware of that reality and open to those kinds of opportunities because they're incredibly enriching. And I also, to kind of make a, a, some, a, just two quick advocacy points, a conservation is as much about research as it is about practice. And not every um, opportunity that's presented to students maybe has those uh, various facets in balance. And it's important for students to realize that they, they can and should um, advocate on their own behalf um, in order to enable um, students to do research um, in their, in their, during graduate study and postgraduate. So that certainly wouldn't be a pre-program requirement, but it's something to think about looking forward. And then finally, before I turn it over to James, I want you to say that um, conservation as a field, this is a, a real uh, a reality, it suffers from lower salaries than would be expected given the incredible education that conservators receive and also the responsibilities that are taken on by conservators. So I just wanted to uh, say that the American Institute for Conservation is at present embarking on a salary survey, which they do periodically to um, help as an advocacy tool. So if you're considering embarking on the field of conservation, you might want to follow um, on the AIC website, the progress in this area, um, because that will definitely aid um, for uh, future advocacy and improvement. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'm going to turn this over to James Ham. Thanks, Alan. That was really great. Um, some of the comments I'm planning to make may uh, duplicate a little bit of what you said, but. In any case, I, I want to thank you at ECPN and the organizers for inviting me. And I want to also mention Patrick Ravinas regrets he can't be here. He's the director of this program. He's working with JJ Chen right now on a workshop in Lima, Peru on uh, digital imaging and documentation. So um, getting to the um, point here of this second uh, topic, 
Um, I have a number of bullet points I just want to go through here. But like any professional field of work, the world of art conservation is continually evolving. But nevertheless, um, the primary demand for a young graduate remains, I believe, grounded in well-developed treatment, investigative, and analytical skills. Um, at the beginning of the career. Um, and I think circumstances, of course, will vary. And um, it may be possible to specialize in a new area of the field, so-called new or neglected area. Um, but I think early specialization, too deep, too fast, might limit the possibilities of landing a job. Our graduates are employed roughly 50-50 between institutional and private practice. I think that's something that everyone should be aware of, that sooner or later um, you're likely to end up, you might say, end up may not be the word, but to be in private practice. I began my career in private practice. Um, and then some will switch back and forth over time for various reasons, perhaps preferring to live in a certain part of the country or the world um, for family reasons, for personal reasons. Um, people will go in or out of private practice. As Ellen mentioned, um, salaries really aren't what they should be considering the many years of preparation, um, not only to get into grad school, but three years there, then perhaps a year or two of fellowship afterwards. Um, we, we to, <clears throat> to excel in this field, we develop, everyone really develops a very high level of expertise. Of course, this is fantastic work to be involved with, and you might say part of the compensation is the sheer joy of handling uh, fine art and artwork that is beyond uh, public access, you might say, behind the ropes. Museums have traditionally relied on volunteer workers historically and paying only uh, some members of the institution, especially at higher levels of administration or in curatorial, curatorial departments, acceptable wages. And this is, this is a, you might say, a problem endemic in the museum business uh, and it's tough to overcome. Another factor I hate to mention it, but women are paid across the country on average about 77% of what men earn. And since the art conservation field is populated mostly by women, and in ever-increasing numbers it seems, the drive to increase salaries in conservation must fight this national trend. There are larger issues at work here, and we may not be able to solve them quickly. Also, I hate to mention it, but it's true, some better known institutions will pay a lower salary since they consider the prestige factor of their name on your resume as part of the compensation package. And in, as in every other field, the ways in which a computer can assist conservators seems to expand nearly every day. Um, this is especially true in the area of imaging, multispectral imaging, deep IR, digital X radiography, and the use of Photoshop to manipulate the image data and extract new information about the artwork or object in question. So entering the field with at least a basic knowledge of Photoshop seems a given. You know, and another, I think, a great thing about this field is once you're in it, your skills, special talents, knowledge, almost no matter how diverse, have a way of expressing themselves in a manner that can make you unique. In other words, your abilities will shape your career, and your career path will cause you to, to develop abilities you may not have recognized <clears throat> excuse me, before. And further, your career goals may change, and that's okay. I mean, how many of us on this panel plan to go into conservation education when we started our careers? I, for one, did not, and, you know, if um, all emerging conservation professionals would consider, ultimately, perhaps, conservation education as an option, um, that would be a great thing, especially because none of your teachers are getting any younger, <laughs> okay? 
Well, that's about it. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much, James and Ellen. Um, that was really great. Okay, and now we're going to turn it over to Peggy Ellis of New York University to wrap up the discussion portion of the program by taking the lead on our third and final topic. Peggy, our third topic. How have expectations on the part of the programs changed in the last five years? Do you think the way you assess, app, you assess applicants has changed? Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists for sharing their, their thoughts with me. Uh, we really have developed a comprehensive discussion of beyond the prerequisites. Um, Rosaline, Debbie, Ellen, and James have have listed many, many, many uh, extra prerequisites, and it may sound a little overwhelming to those of you who are listening today. And I'd like to look at it uh, from a different perspective as um, rather than thinking of it as something, one more thing you have to do for us, think of it as one more way that you will be better informed as you make a very, very important decision about your future because you are making a three or four year commitment to graduate school and as also has been mentioned one or two year postgraduate fellowships. This is a huge commitment and so these beyond the prerequisite activities that, that I hope you will consider uh, will actually serve to make you a better informed applicant and so it's not only something that we're looking for, it's something that will make you a better person. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, in terms of the applicant process um, and the, it, it has, the whole application and interview process has become much more streamlined and transparent uh, with all the programs. Uh, generally speaking, applicants are more fully informed about the actual interview process and what exactly will take place. And we try to make the applicants um, as, uh, as well informed about what they can expect during the interview day so that they can be prepared, but more importantly, uh, so that they can be relaxed and as comfortable as possible. Uh, if overnight stays are involved, I, uh, those programs uh, provide information about uh, who you'll be staying with and where. Uh, and the same is true for the actual interview day. Uh, writing assignments are often described, uh, visual acuity tests, if one is required, uh, will be, uh, you'll, you'll know about it beforehand, and so forth. Um, usually, in order to keep on time, the programs now limit the number of portfolio items that you can show, uh, that including both conservation and artwork. Um, this is really uh, to make sure that things are run efficiently and everyone has um, the same amount of time. Usually you'll be told with whom you're going to meet, so you'll have the opportunity to do a little research beforehand and um, perhaps be able to ask questions uh, when you meet them. Um, the, uh, it's a misconception on the part of the applicants to think that your final artwork or your conservation treatment itself is being judged. Um, the admissions committee is more interested in how you handled the materials or how you arrived at your decision. For example, what went wrong? It, it takes a lot of guts to show uh, something that didn't quite work correctly, but it's very impressive if we hear about the thought processes that went into it. So cr submitting the perfectly created artwork or the flawless conservation treatment is, is not required. Um, in fact, I mean, obviously it won't hurt but we're not looking for fully formed artists or fully formed conservators. We're more interested in how the artwork was created. What materials were used? Um, what did you like about the working properties? Were you working with the properties or were you working against the property? What was your aesthetic intent and did you achieve it? Um, likewise, if you carried out a conservation treatment as instructed with no thought or decision making whatsoever, that doesn't tell us that you will make it that you'll be a good learner. And that's, that's really what we're looking for. It's our job to make you a good conservator. Um, what we're looking for is someone who can follow instructions, obviously, but we're looking for people who can ask questions and, and challenge us as, as instructors. Uh, we want a student who's, who's going to make us think uh, as well. 
Um, at the end of the day, as was mentioned, programs are different. Each program has different strengths. Uh, and we're looking for applicants who can best meet the demands of our specific curriculum. Uh, based on each program's history, and I've been doing interviews for 28 years now, and I would imagine that James has probably been also doing interviews for about 28 years, uh, we have a pretty good sense of who is going to be a good student. Um, a good student is someone who's curious, who's intellectually capable, and will present a challenge to his or her uh, instructor. It's also the, the student who has all those beyond the prerequisites as well. Um, we're really trying to get acquainted with you. Um, again, technology has affected the way programs assess applicants. PowerPoint presentations are now the norm. Um, if anything, in my opinion, I think they have become a little overly rehearsed, so it can be difficult to penetrate through the veneer of the performance and really into the mind of the performer. Um, Again, sometimes PowerPoint presentations can be a crutch. And uh, we want to get to know you. We want to get to know what makes you tick. Um, it's also not atypical uh, for, for applicants to, to have entirely electronic portfolios these days. That's fine. Uh, most applicants still will have a hard, hard copy portfolio and electronic portfolio. The advantages of an electronic portfolio or course is that it allows you to bring things that are usually non-transportable, uh, and it allows you to make take de uh, different different images, different kinds of images. Um, on the other hand, I think that it somewhat impedes spontaneous discussions about tactility, about uh, flexibility, surface surface texture. Um, and sometimes it cuts down on the type of discussion that presents itself naturally when you have an object in front of you. And again, we are all object-oriented. Everything is object-based. So we like to find out how you look in order to see uh, an object. So um, again, electronic portfolios are fine. We, we encourage them. But at the same time, you have to understand that we're dealing with objects object-based people. Um, academically, I think the expectations of the programs have shifted with the field, as so many of my colleagues have, have already observed. Um, the, the conservation field is, is constantly shifting. Uh, just to give you a, a few examples, uh, preventive conservation uh, ha has very much affected um, the areas which, which we have now come to, come to teach. Uh, outreach and advocacy, we now recognize that our graduates are the future of our profession, and our graduates must know how to reach uh, diverse audiences. Um, nonetheless, uh, I can name some specific ones. Uh, the NYU, for example, no longer requires the, the language uh, abilities have, have become somewhat less lessened. Uh, this is due to our art history requirements. Uh, someone has said the, mentioned the importance of going to the websites and seeing um, how these specific prerequisites have, have changed. Um, I know there is a general recognition, a growing interest in electronic media. There is also an interest in, in, um, in technical art history. So I, I think I'll, I'll close there because I see that our time is running out. Um, just, just one more comment. It's, it's so easy as an applicant, 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 excuse me, to divide your world into them versus us. I think it's important to remember that the conservation field is very inclusive. Um, we've had we've had many many discussions where we've we've invoked the, the AIC, the CAC, these organizations. These are member organizations. We are AIC. We are CAC. We are the conservation community. And it's a community that you are just entering. Uh, and so therefore, um, I, for one, would like to extend a warm welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was wonderful. And a huge thank you to all of our speakers for a really interesting discussion with a lot of great information and advice that I know will benefit our audience tremendously. Um,
And I also know that you all have a lot more to contribute, so at this point we're going to turn the program over to Aisha Fuentes, who will moderate our Q&A, and she has quite a few questions for you from our audience members. So, Aisha? Hey there. Uh, so this is going to bring our presentation to a close, but we definitely like to thank our speakers for giving us a sense not only of what is expected of applicants to graduate training programs, but also helping them understand the application process and its development, um, as well as what conservation as a discipline is and can be beyond uh, technical skills or knowledge. And that's been a lot of the emphasis today. That's been great. Also, we'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded, including the question and answer period, and will be made available uh, via AIC's YouTube channel. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions here, and they came in via the registration questionnaire from our audience and participants, as well as the ECPN Facebook page and a couple that were emailed to ECPN officers. Um, the first one that I would like to tackle uh, I thought was a good general question, is what are some common mistakes made by candidates during the application process and or the interview? Is there anyone who would like to speak to that first? I, I could speak to it. This is Debbie. Go, Debbie. Can you hear me? Yep. Do you, do you want me to take, I'll just, I'll just make us, I'll, I'll mention one thing and I'm sure my colleagues can certainly add to it. Before I do so, I, I want to echo um, Peggy's wonderful concluding comments about welcoming um, everyone to this community. And, you know, as we talk about expectations, our goal is not to make you nervous or worried about applying to these programs and that you need to check off every single one of these um, qualities and, and, and skills. But we hope that it will provide you with, with some sense of, of what we're looking for. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a really wonderful comment that Peggy made, and I'm sure that all of my colleagues echo that. In terms of mistakes and, and uh, things that, that I've observed, at least, this is one that I was thinking about as, as Peggy was actually speaking, and that is in the interview. One thing that I have seen with applicants is that they, um, you know, they work so hard and they bring in a, a beautiful conservation uh, portfolio and PowerPoint presentation. And they're cognizant, certainly, of the time frame and, and trying to cover a broad range of their activities and, and uh, initiatives. But they may tend to sort of start off with showing an object and immediately talking about what they did in terms of conservation treatment. So for example, my field is photograph conservation, and they show an albumin print that has multiple tears, and they immediately start talking about this object was torn, and, and I mended it in this way using this adhesive and this approach. My recommendation would be to step back and, and really paint a broad picture at all times about these objects that you're working on. What are they? Who made them? Why are they important? Why do we care? What is an albumin photograph? How does it deteriorate over time? Um, so trying to connect in your presentation uh, not just what you did, but why and the bigger picture kind of thinking that's associated that demonstrates your ability to connect science and art history and cultural context, studio uh, understanding of how materials are made, um, to the, the work at hand, and also addressing the preventive conservation concerns associated with that object. How will it be housed in the future? What are the issues associated with exhibition and display? What happens if it's in Africa versus in Latin America? You know, think about those bigger ideas as you present your uh, conservation experience. You'll be asked those kinds of questions, but just um, don't focus only on the minutia of step-by-step -step. this is how I dealt with this particular conservation treatment. That's just one comment I have. I'm sure many um, of us have other recommendations. Thanks, Debbie. I think that was good. Um, also, kind of following off Peggy's comment about, it, you know, it's your job to make, you, to make us into conservators. Um, what they want to see, what you'd like to see beforehand is actually more how we relate to to what we know already and how we're able to learn. Um, does anyone else have anyone else to, anything else to say about uh, mistakes people have made, maybe in presentations, but also in presenting themselves, or even writing uh, personal statements? Uh, I wouldn't mind just This is Ellen. Um, Wait, hold on. Let's do James and then Ellen. Wait. Okay. 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 All right. Go I, I entirely agree with um, 
Debbie and uh, Peggy special, I thought, uh, did summarize the applicant uh, situation. And we're trying to find out who you are and not so much uh, the, the minutiae, as Debbie says, of, of the actual treatment. So reading notes to get it all right is not <laughs> necessary. Uh, we want to hear you talk, learn about what it is you're actually thinking about, whether you're considering uh, possibilities, um, you know, the, um, the why behind it all, I guess. You weren't just taking orders, you were actually asking questions at the same time as you were working. So, and maybe one other point about uh, a mistake is way too much material. Edit before you arrive. Think about what you're going to do. Review the, the PowerPoint uh, and edit the 10-pound uh, uh, notebook down to maybe 5 pounds. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay, this is Ellen from UCLA Getty. Um, actually, I, of course, I completely agree with what both James and, and Debbie have pointed out, and Peggy as well, that, that we are trying, we're very interested in applicants as people um, and how, you know, how they're thinking and how they're, how they're prepared to learn. But the other thing is that at UCLA Getty, we're also, we're cohort building. So we're interested in, I would, I would um, recommend to um, students, to applicants, that they also focus on the, the others, other people who are applying as well. At UCLA Getty, we, we bring groups of students together, um, groups of applicants together um, across a two-day period. And there's usually some point of intersection where all applicants can actually spend time with each other. And, and with our currently enrolled students. And we're very, very interested in um, their, the, the way in which the students, the applicants display their own kind of senses of collegiality and, and community. So I think that's, that's important. You know, don't, you know, sort of t take an interest in, um, in those, those other applicants as well. So thank you. Hmm. Hi, this is Rosalina at Queens. Um, I would say mistake is an unfortunate word. Um, I think when we look at applicants, when they come in to talk to us either in a formal interview process or in a, an informal information gathering process, we're looking again at the term holistic. Um, as Debbie mentioned, in terms of photographs, it's not just what type of repair they did to an albumin photograph, but why is that albumin photograph important within the context of either the public or the private collection? Why is it important to spend time on that object? We're looking for students that can recognize that there is a broader context, not only in terms of conservation treatment, but cultural understanding of that object and why it's important to spend time on it. Now that's a big ask. That is a huge ask for a student applying for a conservation program. But if a student can recognize that that is an issue, if they can articulate to some level why that's important, that's a huge bonus in their part. Um, I think also if students can demonstrate and understanding that conservation is beyond the treatment of an object. It includes, obviously, treatment. It includes preventive conservation. It includes exhibition. It includes a whole realm of conservation um, responsibilities within an institution or within a private conservator's domain. That would be fantastic. So that's sort of what we're looking for. Hmm. Peggy, did you have anything to add for, from the other programs on this question of common mistakes in, in presenting themselves? That Thank you. It's been well covered. Let, let, let's save some time for another question. You got it. Okay, so the next question that I've been seeing a lot of, and it's been phrased a lot of different ways, um, is concerns the required hands-on pre-program experience. And a lot of people want to know if 
the graduate programs are looking for a diversity of experiences in terms of working both in private practice and larger institutions, or if they're looking for a specific specialization that people have really devoted themselves to specific, uh, one material class or if they've done a variety of different materials. Um, what are the different programs looking for in terms of the materials that people are working on before they actually come to school and where they're working? <laughs> I know it's a huge so question. This, this is Peggy. I'll, I'll answer it, but I'll answer it only from the perspective of NYU, if I could. Perfect. Um, we do not require hands-on conservation experience. <laughs> now, having said that, it is we require a thorough acquaintance with the field of conservation and the materials of art and archaeology. So one of the best ways of getting that is through conservation experience. Um, we do not have any preference whether it's private or institutional. I think what will determine that is not the school, but the availability and the willingness of private and public or, or institutions to accept pre-program interns. Um, that, certainly that's one area of this process that, that could use some attention, I think. Um, I know many institutions have quite a formalized a program of accepting pre-program interns, and others have informal, and it's the same with private. So rather than, than getting tangled up, is private better than institutional, I, I suspect that that decision may be made uh, for you. Um, <laughs> in terms of what kind of conservation treatment is preferable, um, our approach is a diversity of materials. As I said, you, we do not expect you to come as a fully formed paper conservator. Um, that's our job, to treat you to be a paper conservator. I would like to know that you've worked with paper, you've worked with ceramics, and that you have a natural affinity for one. That, that I think, is more important. And again, this is for your edification. You will find out if you like the feeling of paint. You will find out if you like three dimensions or two dimensions. So it's it's really for your benefit to try out a diversity of, of hands-on program experience in order to, to know for yourself uh, what your strength is or what your natural inclination is. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add to that, specifically um, Ellen coming from the UCLA program? Yes. Different thing. Yeah, thanks, Aisha. I, I actually do. Um, so at UCLA Getty, we, we do require that students uh, apply with somewhere between 200 and 400 hours of pre-program experience. And um, that said, um, we, we have no particular preference to whether or not that's you know, based in a museum or in a private practice. We recognize that, um, that pre-program internships are opportunistic, you know, that one has to move in the direction of what's being offered. Um, and again, really what we're trying to see is that we're trying to see that students demonstrate this kind of collective skill set of, you know, focus and interest in working um, with, you know, with their hands. And so, I mean, I have to say that we've actually, we've accepted students who've done archaeological drawing um, as part of their pre-program um, application as part of their pre-program internship work. Um, we also we also do look for students because UCLA Getty is a program that's devoted to archaeological and ethnographic materials. We do try to look out to um, see whether students have demonstrated some previous interest in um, in those those areas of material culture. Um, and so, it's I would say it's it's um, beneficial for an applicant to uh, try to locate their pre-program internship work um, in a way that allows them to work with indigenous collections or archaeological materials, or even you know or historic materials that are being interpreted um, more in a more of a community way. So that's. That's, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to answer on that. 
Sure. And then I was also wondering, Rosalie, your program um, differs from Peggy in that people kind of come with their material class in mind. Do you have anything to add? Is that different for you in terms of people's program and pre-program experience? I know it's not required, but in terms of what you see from applicants? Great. Thanks, Aisha. Um, yes, we're a little bit different in that, um, as you mentioned, students apply directly to their major. But we also don't have the requirement that students have to have had um, experience in a conservation lab. So we're looking for students who can demonstrate a curiosity about art history, archaeology, materials, whatever it is, so that they have more of a holistic overview of what's involved in heritage preservation, heritage production, if you will. We're looking for students that would be able to demonstrate um, a curiosity, a knowledge, an ability working with different materials. And what, Be what Peggy mentioned was, um, what are you doing? What, if you're coming into paper, do you have experience? Do you actually have an affinity for working with paper? So we're looking for that sort of experience. Um, equally, we're looking for students that may have taken shorter courses to enhance their portfolios. So it might be not academic or tertiary level education, but if somebody has gone through a four-year um, undergraduate program in art history or, say, microbiology or even chemical engineering, for instance, um, and they discover, oh my god, I want to be an art conservator, have they done in the year or so before they're able to uh, um, apply for art conservation at Queen's or any other program? Have they been able to pick up a range of other programs or other conservation or art history or studio art courses that demonstrate an ongoing interest and ability in terms of hand skills, visual acuity, and whatnot? So we're, we're tend, we tend to be a bit more, um, uh, I guess holistic is the word to look for. So it basically it's curiosity, it's intellectual ability, academic excellence and the ability to focus on what you're doing and for us an understanding and a recognition that what you're applying for as your major is what you want to do. So I guess that's it. Okay, good. Th thank you. Um, do James or Debbie, either of you want to add anything to this discussion of pre-program experience and, and what it should look like in order to apply to your programs? This is Debbie. I'd, I'd like to just add, hopefully without repeating, um, and just to say that for our program, we do require experience, 400 hours at the time of application, but the reality is that most of the successful applicants have uh, more than, significantly more than 400 hours. We don't um, care if it's private or public, institutional, um, or whatever. I just want to point out a couple things. One is, on our website, we try to ho post um, as often as possible pre-program and internship opportunities. And so um, that's one site that individuals can go to as you're trying to sort out where are these opportunities. That can be difficult to find at times. And I think all of us um, are willing, again, to advise one-on-one -on -one if someone is located in Oklahoma or in Atlanta, wherever they might be, trying to seek out experience, uh, they should not hesitate to reach out to us because we can connect to our alums and to individuals we know who have hosted pre-program candidates in the past. Also, and more importantly, really, for those in the United States, is ECPN and your geographic liaisons, who I think are just superb in helping individuals in various regions identify pre-program opportunities. So we do require it. We do try to help wherever possible to identify opportunities that are ideally paid. Um, and then we encourage individuals in terms of a diversity of materials, that's wonderful if it's possible. And um, as my colleagues have noticed that are noted, that just helps to uh, ensure that you're moving in the right direction, that you have a sense of what these wonderful opportunities are available to you in various disciplines within our field, and we welcome experience in conservation treatment, documentation, analysis, and of course, preventive conservation. Oh, this is James in Buffalo. Yes, um, I concur with everything. We do not have a requirement uh, of a specific number of hours. 
for pre-program experience. Um, and since a number of our applicants are also applying to the other programs, almost by default, um, there is um, about 400 hours, in fact. Um, we don't ask for, uh, we, we don't assemble a class based on specialty. We don't um, ask for that, but it seems that most of the opportunities seem to be in the world of objects, and uh, there are fewer in um, paintings. I've noticed that. And, and there's a tendency to go with your strengths. In other words, if you've invested time as a pre-program person in objects conservation, it seems to make sense to continue in that direction. But we give everyone here um, a full year before they need to decide their specialties. So that, that's all I really want to add. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, hope, I think we've covered just about every part of what people have asked in terms of what kind of institution and things like that. Um, we have a shorter question here, actually. Uh, that anybody is welcome to answer, and it's which information in the personal statement can help you in the candidate's evaluation? What are you looking for in a personal statement? Would anyone like to answer that specifically? Hmm. <laughs> I'll call on you. <laughs> okay, Debbie, go first. Okay, I just unmuted myself. In a personal statement, what are we looking for? It's a good question, actually, and I've been asked that um, many times. It's an opportunity to present yourself in a in two or three, no more than really three pages, to provide some sense of your commitment to the field. You know, we'll have your resume, and so you need not repeat the resume. That's you know, we're going to study that carefully. We'll understand where you've worked in various places. But the personal statement provides, I guess, your really your first chance to demonstrate your ability to connect all these experiences. How have your academic study in chemistry influenced your work that you might have done as a pre-program candidate at this institution or in this conservation laboratory? So it provides in a, again, in, in not an extended 10-page document, but two or three pages, four pages at the most, I would say, an opportunity to share with us why this is a field that you're interested in and engaging with, why you feel passionate about the importance of cultural heritage preservation, and how your preparation has prepared you towards this goal, both academically and uh, your experience. Um, th this, is, this is Peggy. Um, I, I agree with, with Debbie, absolutely, but in, when you're telling us about your, your passion and commitment to the conservation of cultural heritage, I would try to be as specific as possible because it's very easy to say things like, art is wonderful, I'm thrilled in front of a painting. Um, tell, uh, in thinking back of the essays that I've read, the personal statements that I've read, I've been most engaged by those that tell stories about themselves. Tell us the story of you, and in that story, demonstrate your commitment to, to cultural heritage using specifics. And it doesn't all have to be the Sistine ceiling. <laughs> it can be something very personal. I remember one vividly that was about a grandparent who painted um, and the effort that the applicant wanted to uh, go to, to to preserve her grandfather's painting. But um, so tell us. Tell us the story, and, and um, uh, I, I tend to be a bit of a stickler, but make sure it's well written and there's no typos. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else have anything to uh, share with the personal statements, what they mean to them? Uh, yeah, actually, this is Rosalind. Um, I agree with both Peggy and Debbie. Make it personal. Um, broad brushstrokes in terms of why a specific art genre means something to you is great, it's wonderful, but it's not really meaningful. Um, if you can identify to a specific story, such as uh, what Peggy illustrated, or if you're able to say, I was working at, for example, Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump, I was able to work with X cultural group and I was able to do 
preservation, conservation, outreach, whatever your experience was to the benefit of cultural heritage overall, and this was meaningful to you, and that you, as an applicant, see the broader reach of what you did. That is useful, that is meaningful to us as an adjudication board. It is useful to us if you can see um, anything broader than just the minutia of what you did. Say you were able to demonstrate that you had done outreach with, even through YMCA groups, working with disadvantaged kids in an inner city, you were able to bring art, whatever, uh, a cultural heritage component to that group, you were able to expand the knowledge base. That is important because it indicates to us that you have curiosity, you have ability, you have a broader um, approach, you have team building, you have teamwork skills, all the rest. So those are things that we're looking for in addition to just straight art history. So more holistic, more broad, more overview, but again, if you can connect it to a story, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, James or Ellen, do you have anything to add on this question in terms of personal statements? Yeah, this is Ellen. Um, I, you know, I would say I agree with um, all of my colleagues thus far, and I think, I think it is true that, you know, everybody who has gotten to the point of putting in their application so that they're writing that personal statement typically has gone through some sort of epiphany about the fact that they've found this field through all of the various means that we've been talking about over this past hour, you know, by looking at websites, by taking classes, by, um, you know, doing pre-program internships. And um, I think that it's, it's very compelling for all of us to read, um, kind of, I'm really, uh, re you know, referring back to what my colleagues have said, but to read about what what personally for you um, contributed to that kind of epiphany? You know, where you've decided that there's a certain set of um, skills and interests that you have that actually tra which would translate into your desire to study this field. So I think that those constitute really good essays. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Ellen. James, did you want to add anything or? Well, it's hard to add anything. This is all <laughs> excellent. Um, yeah, I, I guess just in summary, we want to hear your story, and we want it to be personal. We want to see the search, the process of finding this career. I actually uh, prefer that someone find it from, from another direction, you might say, uh, have a little more of a diverse background. Um, and uh, then there is that moment, that epiphany, when this comes together, the disparate interests of an individual all of a sudden converge in this great field of our conservation. So I, I like to read those stories. And I, we are also sticklers for, um, hey, it's a chance to tell us that you can write. I <laughs> want to know. <laughs> um, there's writing's a key part of what we do and publishing papers, et cetera, and this is your ability to tell us that you can do it. Aisha, this is Debbie. Can I just add one other quick thought to of all of this? It's really, it's really great. And, um, Please. But um, another thing in the personal statement that I enjoy reading is a little bit about a candidate's long-term goals. Where do they see themselves? What do they hope to do? How do they hope to make a difference? Do they hope to engage with the public, work globally, um, you know, educate dealers, whatever that might be? And sometimes there's an opportunity to include that somewhere in that statement. And I. Um, I look to that and, you know, are they interested in a leadership role? What, what sort of, what are they thinking now in terms of their five and ten year goals? Excellent. Thank you. Um, those are a really good answer to it, but could have been a very short question, but that was, that was great. That was very comprehensive. Um, I think probably we're going to be on our final question here. We've only got about 15 minutes left. Um, but I think this is a question that seems like it would be uh, a little bit much broader much than the previous question, but 
what do you wish someone had told you when you were starting on your path to becoming a professional conservator and kind of looking at um, all of the skills and knowledge that you were required to to uh, study and to to master in some ways, but also in terms of your your personal journey as a as a conservator? What do you wish someone had told you when you were just kind of starting that and considering it? <laughs> Debbie, I know you have to leave at 10.30, so maybe I'll call on you first, or sorry, 1.30. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I was just writing notes. Um, Do you want me to play some hold music? Well, that's a good... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'll get distracted. No, I mean, that's a great question, and... Um, I feel so privileged to be in this field. You know, I'm trying to think, what do I wish I know? Of course, we, as James mentioned, I don't think any of us realized we would be conservation educators. And let me just say that we desperately need individuals who hope to pursue uh, conservation education in, in a variety of different ways, uh, working with the public, working with allied professionals, working with future conservators, et cetera. I'm not sure. Um, certainly, I had that sense, although I have to say that I was lucky to enter the field of photograph conservation early on, and one of my goals was to teach. And so I feel enormously fortunate to be doing that now. I don't know what I wish someone had told me. I, I've learned, certainly I never imagined I would be working globally, but that's been such a great experience and one that I also encourage everyone to pursue. I, I probably didn't imagine that I would be fundraising and involved so actively in advocacy as opposed to sitting at a, a bench mending photographs and, and dealing with conservation treatment, but I've welcomed that opportunity and I think um, it's been a great joy and a privilege. But um, do I wish that I had known a little bit more about that future, the management and the administrative aspect of my job, perhaps, but it's something you learn um, on the job as well. So I'm not sure I have such a great answer for you all in that, except um, that you are always learning. And uh, every single day, every single thing that we do, uh, as we teach, we learn. As we work with other collections, we learn. We recognize what we wish we had known. And, and certainly the field has changed quite significantly, particularly in photograph conservation. And there are areas that I wish I had known more about early on. But, um, but I don't have a specific thing that I wish someone had told me. I, I would urge everyone, though, to connect with those who are advising them and ask those questions and, and see what they have to say. That was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have anything that they wish they had heard about? I think definitely knowing about how much administration and things, um, how much of our job involves actually just working with people and not at the bench. I think that's a really important thing to hear, especially for pre-programmed people um, who are usually looking for that hands-on experience and then sometimes getting frustrated when they don't get it. Hi, this is Rosaline. Go. Oh. In addition to everything that Debbie said, which I fully, fully, totally agree with, I guess my approach to all of this, and my approach to life in general, falls on a quote that I read in a mystery novel that I can't remember years and years ago, but I know it was in the right-hand page at the bottom paragraph, and the phrase that jumped off the page was, flexibility is the key to all happiness. <laughs> and I have taken this for life and for work. Um, I started off at Queen's. In graduate of 1989 um, as a paper conservator. My life has diverged radically since then to working pri in private conservation. And as Debbie said, I don't think any of us thought when we would get into conservation that we'd be doing conservation education. That has unfolded for me. Um, but it's being flexible. It's seeing what opportunities are available to you. It's, as I mentioned in my initial um, discussion at the top of this webinar, it's self-awareness. Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Focus on strengths. Build on your weaknesses. Um, it's looking at what is available to you. When I started off in conservation as a paper conservator, I never realized that we'd be segueing into digital, and I'm sure Debbie would say with photographs, into digital photography, 
Um, so the world is changing around us. We have to be flexible. We have to be adaptable. We have to be responsible for the heritage collections that preceded us. We have to be responsive to the collections that are being created now and in the future. So I guess it's flexibility. And I think that's exciting. It's wonderful. It's daunting. It's, it's confusing. It's, it's everything, but it's absolutely exciting. So I think if I could say anything to conservators or applicants to conservation programs now is saying that this is an incredible field. We have an incredible base of knowledge and literature behind us, but we have a huge amount to do ahead of us, and you can be part of it. Yeah, if Excellent. I just Thank you. This uh, is JJ uh, Allen. Yeah. Names. Oh. Um, you know, Rosalind has done really well, and I wrote a few notes here, and the very first thing I wrote down was flexibility, to be mm -hmm. flexible. And that's just good advice for a living, not necessarily for those going into conservation. Always learning, being open-minded, really to follow your passion. Debbie mentioned that word, passion, I believe, and that's really important. And you may find conservation actually isn't <laughs> the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. but you, need, you need to find that out. So, um, but absolutely, uh, things change, you will change, and that's what living is all about, being flexible, successful living. And okay, Ellen? this is Ellen. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting when I thought about what do you wish someone had told you. So I think the thing that I wish someone had told me was that the entire world was not going to be crazy gung-ho conservation as much as I was. <laughs> that, that, that it was possible that I might actually um, work with people who did not find that this was, you know, when the, the absolute most important um, aspect um, and, and this incredible privilege, you know, this work that we do. So w what, that, what that really translates into is um, when you join um, the staff within a museum or at a university or an institute or wherever, um, the fact is that you are um, you're this ambassador for what you do. And you're using your own kind of your own sort of enthusiasm and knowledge and diplomacy to um, convince people, you know, demonstrate your knowledge and the significance of what you do. And that, and it's incredible how much time, you know, that that is a really really important component of our work as well, and something that we we do so that we. Uh, you know, kind of bring people along, win people over, um, and and convince them of what we all know for certain, <laughs> which is, you know, that cultural heritage and its preservation is um, totally key. So that's actually that's my uh, my statement on this. Thanks. <laughs> uh, th this is Peggy. I, I was very fortunate to have extremely good advice going into conservation, but I wish they had told me how much more wonderful conservation was and how many adventures were laying in a wait for me, uh, waiting for me and how many different directions were possible. Women uh, often ask me, is this a good field for, for women? And I believe it is because it's a relatively young field and there's no established route to uh, a successful career. If you go to law school, you know you're going to have to join a law firm. You're going to try for partner in seven years. If you don't become partner, your, your next steps are fairly predictable. It's not like that in conservation. Uh, the, the, I saw it as opportunity everywhere I turned uh, and that it was really up to me to be proactive in seizing those opportunities. If that is not comfortable for you, as Jane said, um, it's perhaps conservation is, is not a good career choice because there are so many opportunities and they're changing every day. 
Excellent. Those were fantastic answers from everybody. Thanks so much. Um, we have about six minutes left in our program, and I think I would actually just like to ask a real quick question with our remaining couple minutes, um, a technical question. And it's, what kind of research skills would an admissions committee prefer to see in a candidate? Um, is there anyone who could take that on real quick? Um, I'm, this is Ellen from UCLA yeah. Getty. I'm happy to take that on, Aisha. Thank um, you, Ellen. So, of course. So, so um, at UCLA Getty, actually, our admissions committee includes faculty from allied fields. Um, who, so in other words, their own backgrounds is not particularly conservation. They may be an archaeologist or a scientist or an anthropologist, but they're um, part of the professoriate at the university. And um, there, it's, it's interesting, we were talking about the writing statement earlier. Of course, we also want to see people write, um, you know, write with great clarity and, you know, correct grammar and spelling, etc. But we actually, we ask for a sample, a research sample, in the application process. And that sample is really being looked at. It, we're very ecumenical. It can be really drawn from absolutely any field. But we just want to see that the student was capable of going through um, source material, you know, having a hypothesis, going through source material, citing their sources, um, coming to a conclusion and presenting some form of written work. And I must say that most often we encourage students when they contact us um, in advance of their application, we, we encourage students to take a paper that they've done in, in undergraduate school or graduate school um, for which they feel particularly proud um, and to just submit that. So that's that's kind of my answer on that question. Thanks. Excellent. Anybody from a program that doesn't have a, a research actual uh, sample as part of their application and how someone, an applicant, could better present themselves as a researcher since it's so much of what they do? Would anyone say that? This is Debbie. I'll, yeah, I'll just say we don't. Um, Oh, okay. We don't um, require the paper, though I think that that is um, certainly a welcome addition, but uh, many of our applicants will include that in their portfolio, certainly. So it's not submitted ahead with the dossier, but um, we welcome papers and research initiatives and projects in all realms, just as Ellen said, that just demonstrate independent thinking or collaborative work that they might be involved in, and that's something that they can include in their conservation portfolio. Um, even though it may be an art historical paper, it doesn't necessarily have to be just in conservation. So that um, idea of the importance of research in, in all areas is, I think, probably emphasized by all of us. Some may require papers and some might not. And I think, um, again, that's where our applicants can seek out advice on projects and initiatives that they might become involved in. But one point that Ellen made also that I think is so important is this whole commitment to professional engagement and dissemination. So it's not just doing the research, but sharing that with others, whoever those audiences might be. That's something that we're always looking for and something that's urgently needed, of course, in our field as we move forward. Thank you. That was an excellent point. Um, does anyone have anything real quick to add, or should we just... Anyone? Michelle? Michelle, um, no, I think that'll just about do it, Aisha. Uh, I think you'll join me in thanking our speakers once again and thanking our audience on behalf of ECPN. We've really enjoyed having you today. So many wonderful points, concrete advice, and more philosophical discussion. Um, and we hope that you'll join us again in the future for more ECPN programming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.